So let me welcome back everyone. And um, Ralph has, okay, has already st started sharing his screen. Very nice, great to have you uh, on this event, Ralph. Um, by now you know the rules, right? 25 minutes for you. And I'll let you know, uh, we tend to go. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks so much for, uh, for, for having us. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, given circumstances. So this is joint work with Xavier Gebex, um, and it's, um, it's a brand new uh, uh, paper, so like comments, feedback would be uh, very welcome to us. Um, so the title is In Search of the Origins of Financial Fluctuations, the Inelastic Markets Hypothesis. So, so we really go back to the, to the old question, like trying to understand why markets are so volatile. And of course, like there's lots of answers in the literature uh, and various theories as to why this may be the case related to time varying risk aversion, uh, fluctuations in macroeconomic risks, changes, um, changing beliefs about fundamentals. But there's one common feature across all of those models, both rational and behavioral, and that is that markets are macroelastic. Um, and so it means that like buying 1% of the market is going to move prices by much less than 0.1% in most models. Now, the models are even more microelastic, uh, which relates to the, to the previous paper, which means that, that if you swap like, like Apple for Google, the price impact is going to be really, really small in most of these models. This paper is about the macro elasticity, meaning that you move money from bonds to stocks and, and how much do prices move in that case. So we're gonna propose an alternative, uh, but complementary view to that, um, to the literature. And we're gonna explore the idea that, that markets may be macro inelastic. And we're going to refer to this as the inelastic markets hypothesis. So, so the idea here is that capital flows can have a quantitatively meaningful impact on, on prices. Uh, again, very similar to the previous to the previous paper. Um, now, given that sort of this is a different um, different perspective than than the models that are out there, like it sort of like raises two questions: like why and why would we explore this idea in the first place? Like, are there reasons to believe that this may be true? Um, and so I'm gonna give you a couple of, 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 of pieces of evidence that, that got us thinking about this. Um, and secondly, like, suppose it is true, then like, why do we care? And I'm gonna sort of like argue that uh, the implications are kind of like far reaching. And so sort of getting an answer to this question is we think is important. So let me give you some sort of like, like pieces of evidence why the market may be inelastic. If you start looking at, at sort of like different investors who actually own, own equities, um, then you'll quickly see that like many of the investors institutions, they, they are constrained. So if you think about all equity funds, obviously they cannot provide any elasticity if prices move. They're like 100% invested in equities. Even like funds that are like 70, 30 split between stocks and bonds, they have very limited ability to move in response to prices. Now, if you then go down to different invest investor classes, you kind of quickly run out of investors who can, who can make the market really elastic. And so you may wonder, um, well, what about hedge funds? Can they act as, uh, as macro arbitrageurs? Um, uh, it turns out that that's not, not really the case because first of all, they're small. So they own like 5% of the market. And on top of that, they tend to reduce allocations in bad times, perhaps because they experience outflows themselves or because risk constraints are binding or things like that. Okay, and so, so the first observation is that many institutions just are very limited in terms of what they can do, but constrained by their mandates. Secondly, if you look at the quantity side, and this is really something that like kind of big picture we wanna bring into asset pricing, portfolio holding quantities, flows and things like that, then flows across investor sectors are like really small. Um, and so, so the typical sort of reallocation of capital between let's say insurance companies and mutual funds and households is order of magnitude like half percent per quarter. And I'm going to show you more of that. So think of like, there's a $30 trillion US stock market. The typical flow from one quarter to the next between one and one group of investors and another is just order of magnitude like 100, 200 billion. Okay, and so, so that means that prices move a lot, but quantities move very, move very little. If you interpret that in a very elastic world, that means that all investors get, get the same demand stock. If you interpret it alternatively in, in an inelastic world, then of course these relatively small flows can start to move prices. The third piece of evidence is, is part based on theory, part based on, on empirical work. So, so there's a large literature on microelasticities. And again, that is sort of like, like the price impact if you, if you, let's say, add a particular stock to the index or you swap Apple for Google. Now, in the theoretical models that we have, what you will find is that the elasticity, the macroelasticity is order of magnitude like 10 to 20. Okay, so if you move prices by 1%, quantities will move by 20%. In all of our theoretical models, or in most models, 
the micro elasticity is much higher than the macro elasticity. So order of magnitude for the micro elasticity is something like five, 6,000 if you calibrate a reasonable model. The empirical estimates for the micro elasticity order of magnitude are around one. And so you can sort of see the tension where where we're sort of in, 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 in the model, sort of the micro elasticity is well above the macro elasticity, but the empirical estimate of the micro elasticity is like way below what models imply. Okay, and so that sort of like makes it, we think sort of like, like, like reasonable to exp sort of like explore um, to what extent markets can be macro inelastic and what the implications are. Now, what are the implications uh, as we can see them at this point is that first of all, flows are going to be impactful. So our calibration estimation implies that about a third uh, and probably like closer to a half of all stock market fluctuations are driven by flows. Secondly, like, like we can start like thinking about replacing the dark matter or at least taking one step towards resolving that by replacing fluctuations in prices with like tangible flows. And so, because now we can sort of like relate every movement in the market back to flows and demand sets of different investors. And we can then try to think about like what motivates flows into different sectors or, or, or demand sets by those investors. Thirdly, um, and, and re related to the, um, um, to, to the policy relevance potentially is that several questions that are, are typically like irrelevant or uninteresting in traditional models, they become interesting. So first of all, government intervention in equity markets can be surprisingly powerful. So QE for equities uh, can have a large impact. Um, secondly, um, firms can start acting as arbitrageurs because like, like flows in our model, like position flows are gonna introduce sort of like long lasting deviations in prices from long-term trends. And that may sort of like allow firms to start like acting as, as a stabilizing force and, and issue equity when prices are high and buy back equities when prices are relatively low. And so, so there's a role for those kind of like actors in our model that otherwise wouldn't play, wouldn't play a role. Now then the question of course is well, how elastic is the stock market? And, and this is a hard question. And so Xavier and I wrote another paper um, uh, trying to answer this question. Um, and we refer to this as granular instrumental variables as a methodology. And the basic idea is that in lots of settings, not just in our particular setting, but in lots of settings, the economy is made up out of like kind of a large number of like investor firms or, or industries, but some are very large and, and, and there's many of them that are, that are quite small. And it is particularly the idiosyncratic shocks to the large uh, investors in our case uh, that still show up in aggregate prices or aggregate uh, measures of economic activity or aggregate time series in general. And so that means that you can use idiosyncratic shocks to large institutions um, as, as, as instruments, and we show how to do this sort of efficiently. And so we're going to use this methodology um, uh, to provide estimates using flow of funds data and 13F data. So our estimates imply that uh, if you pur purchase 1% of the market, um, the, the, the value is going to go up by 3 to 8%. So it puts it below the micro LSSP, consistent with our theories. But of course, this implied elasticity is much lower than, than what is implied by the standard models. In the theory part, we're gonna use 5%. Five, five so by $1, prices go up by five. Um, there's no evidence of mean reversion, um, uh, but of course, confidence intervals widen if you go to longer horizons. And we do wanna stress that, that, that so sort of this idea of like inelastic markets very much remains an hypothesis. Like we've been discussing for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, how to estimate risk aversion, EIS, micro elasticities, and, and, and estimating the macro elasticity is essentially just as complicated as, as these other parameters. So any ideas you may have about new approaches, new methods to, um, to pin down the elasticity are very much, very much welcomed. Um, so this is our, our best attempt so far. So what do we do in the paper? I'm gonna give you like a very simple model first, uh, just to sort of like show you how inelasticity can come about. The paper also contains sort of a general equilibrium model that we, that we can calibrate. Um, and it allows us to think about sort of the transmission of shocks to the real, to the real economy. Now we use the model also as sort of a conceptual framework to guide the empirical analysis. So for instance, how do you even measure flows into the aggregate stock market? Because for every buyer, there's a seller. So how do you even sort of like get to the notion that there was an inflow into, inflow into the market? And so the model is gonna clarify that, that for us. And then we're gonna provide these estimates and uh, measure flows consistently with the theory and then think about potential drivers, like in terms of like how are they connected to like macro fundamentals and beliefs and things like that. Okay, so let me start with a couple of facts, uh, just to sort of get everyone on the same page in terms of like what quantity data looks like. So 
Uh, this is flow of funds. So here you see like, like who owns the US stock market in 2018 in the green bars um, and in 1993 in the orange bars. And so you see the, the big drop off here uh, for households is the transition away from direct, directly owning equities to institutions managing their capital. Um, and you see the growth of like mutual funds, the foreign sector, ETFs, and, and so on. Okay. Now, one thing to note here is that broker dealers that have, have received quite a bit of attention in the asset pricing literature, they're relatively small. And so that means that if you think that they are providing sort of like analysis to the, to the aggregate stock market, you must truly believe that the stock market is very inelastic uh, because the flows that they experience are just like really, really small. Okay. And so they can't really step in if you see very large flows. Now then, like in order to get a sense of like, like how, how flows move around, um, we're going to look at an extreme episode and the paper looks at, at other periods as well. But we're going to zoom in on, 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 the, on the financial crisis. And so what you see over here in the green bars are the average flows per quarter. Orange bars are the flows in, in 2008 Q4, which was the most extreme uh, return realization. And, 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 and then you see the different sectors. Negative bars mean they're selling. The positive bars means that they're buying. And everything is normalized here by the size of the market. And so there's two things I want you to take away from this figure. First of all, the overall flows are just really, really small. So households sell on average like half a percent of the stock market every, every quarter. Again, $30 trillion stock market, half a percent is 150 billion. So even though prices move around like, like by 50%, the flows that you see across these sectors is like really, really small. And so that means that, that if you live in sort of an elastic world, everyone must have exactly the same shock uh, to beliefs, to preferences or, or, or things like that. And it must mean that like, let's say state and local pension plans and mutual funds and hedge funds, they all agree on what exactly that, that demand shock is. Alternatively, um, sort of, of course, like we're thinking about a world where things are more in last. Now, the second thing that's interesting is that sort of your, I know, your natural would-be arbitrageurs don't really show up as buying a lot of equities. The group that buys the most during this period are in fact state and local pension plans. So kind of like more longer term investors whose equity allocation dropped because prices fell and are rebalancing back to back to target. Okay, and so very little quantity movement even though prices move, move a lot. Now, another way to look at this is using micro data for uh, mutual funds, ETFs and state and local uh, pension plans. Um, and what you see over here is their equity allocations aggregated according to our, to our model. And you see that they're very flat over time. Okay, so even though risk premium and prices move around, their allocations are very, very flat. Okay, and so we're gonna explore the equilibrium implications of these, of these facts. So let me give you like a simple uh, two period model uh, to give you a feeling for what this, how this works. So there's going to be, we're gonna fix the interest rate, we're gonna fix the risk premium. In the, in the general model, we're gonna endogenize those. But just to get the idea, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix them. There's going to be two assets, uh, equities, average stock market, Supply QS, prices and endogenous. There's a bond in, in, in perfectly elastic supply BS. Price is going to be fixed at fixed at one. And now there's going to be two funds. One fund is a pure bond fund or your money market mutual fund. And then there's a balanced fund. Now that balanced fund has an equity weight, which is the left hand side over here, that is equal to some unconditional theta, let's say 70, 30. And then it may respond to deviations from the risk premium. So deviations from the risk premium are pi hat. How responsive the fund is, is, is measured by kappa. And so kappa in our traditional models is like really high, order of magnitude like 20, 25. We're gonna explore the idea that kappa is quite a bit lower than that. If kappa is 20, 25, uh, 20 or 25, that means that if you have a 1% change in risk premium, like your portfolio weight is gonna change by 20 to 25%, which, which we don't really see in the data. So suppose we live in this environment, like just stocks and bonds, and you have these like, like funds um, that have this particular mandate, what happens if you start moving money from the bond fund to the, to the balance fund? So we're gonna consider a, a flow of, of little f, which is the dollar flow delta f divided by one. Okay, so this is the percent flow into the market. And then, so the, the first result that we show is that, that the percent change in equity prices is equal to the flow divided by zeta. So one over zeta is, is the multiplier. So by 1% of the market and, price, and that flow gets amplified by one over zeta. So the key thing that we're after empirically and, and in calibration is going to be that one over zeta. Okay, so that's the one parameter we, we care about. Now in this simple model, 
that zeta is equal to one minus theta plus kappa delta. So remember, theta is sort of your long run average equity share. So if we look back over here, let's say it's something between between 60 and 100%. Um, so let's say set it to 80%. Then kappa over here is the responsiveness to the risk premium. Okay, in our calibrations, we're gonna set it to one, uh, one and a half to two. And delta is the, is the dividend yield, so something around 4%. So plug in these numbers and you're gonna get something order of magnitude that zeta is something like 0 0.2. So that means that, that one over zeta is five, so you buy one cent of the market to move prices by five, by 5%. Five now this model also sort of can be used to like, like, like um, illustrate how to measure flows properly into the market. Because in this case, the balance fund was holding all the equities before the inflow. It's hold, holding all the equity after the inflow. So how do we measure the flow into the stock market, even though clearly money went from the bond fund to the balance to the balance fund? So let me give you a simple example to illustrate that. So the balance fund, let's say, holds 80% in equities, no sensitivity to the risk premium, so kappa, kappa zero. <clears throat> and there's 80 shares initially, B units of the bond, initial price of the equity is one. So that means that there's $80 in stocks, $20 in bonds, $100 in total for the balance fund. The pure bond fund holds B minus the 20, minus 20, $20 in bonds. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move $1 from our bond fund to the balance fund. Now that is a flow of 1%, okay, because the, the total value of the fund was 100. What is gonna happen in equilibrium is that the pure bond fund is gonna own B minus 21 because it, it just lost $1. The balance fund gets $21 in bonds. And in order to maintain the four to one ratio, according to its mandate, stock prices have to go up to $84. To $84. So that gives you the multiplier, 84 over 80 of, of, of like, like five. But also what it clarifies is how to measure flows correctly into the stock market. The balance fund holds equities before and after the inflow, but the flow into the market is actually measured by what happens to the outside asset, what happens to the bond position of those, of those investors. Okay, and that sort of gives you a way of how to measure flows into the aggregate stock market and gets around the sort of for every buyer there's a seller. Because in this case, of course, those Identities are all satisfied, but yet there's a clear info into the market. Okay, and so that's what this is all about. Nine minutes left. Okay, so we extend this to infinite infinite horizon. Um, so what you get is that the present value, um, or that the price is equal um, to the present value of, of future cash flows. Um, but it also reflects expectations about future flows. And we also introduce demand source over here. Now, there's, there's two things that are sort of like important here. In our model, if there's a permanent inflow into, into the market, then prices jump up and they're going to stay there. So the typical empirical strategy that looks at price pressure, that looks at prices that jump up and mean revert, it wouldn't necessarily work in this case. So if let's say Vanguard or BlackRock introduces a new fund that attracts a certain amount of capital, that capital is very sleepy and is gonna stay there, then prices jump up and they will stay there as well. And so prices are higher, expected return are permanently a little bit lower, um, and it makes it very hard to detect, like, like sort of like um, whether this was information or 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 um, or uninformed trading. Um, <clears throat> now, if flows are mean reverting, then of course you're going to sort of get a dampened effect because the market is forward looking and un understands that sort of these flows will will leave the market again in the in the future. Okay. Um, we think about how to aggregate across investors. So there's investors with different demand curves, different elasticities. Then it turns out that the way you aggregate our model is by using equity weights. So you don't use AUM weights, but you actually use the equity shares of the fund in the market. And that typically gives you um, uh, um, sort of like a higher, um, higher ex expected values for, uh, for theta for the average equity share, which is critical for us in the, in the theory compared to AUM, AUM weighted average. Okay, so let me then um, show you some of the uh, um, some of the empirical results. So, so as I mentioned, so there's like long literature trying to estimate um, risk aversion, EIS, and, and microelasticities. And so here we're set out to estimate sort of this new parameter zeta, and we're going to use uh, the GIV methodology to to do this. So just to give you like a one slide summary um, um, of of the idea, um, um, I'm going to give you the the sort of simplest possible setup that we that we have. So some notation excess is the size weighted average of, of, um, of changes in X or of X. XE is the equal weighted average. And so GIV is gonna all work on differences between size and equal weighted averages. We're gonna model demand for investor I, 
as being responsive to prices with coefficient zeta. There's going to be a common factor eta. So we may all have like a demand shock because we learned that um, economic growth is gonna slow down, let's say. Investors may have different exposures to these common factors and it could be idiosyncratic demand shock COI. Now, if you impose market clearing, what you get is that prices are equal to one over zeta times the size weighted average of idiosyncratic shocks and the size weighted average of exposures times, times, the, times the demand shock. And so, what GIV essentially does is that it isolates these idiosyncratic shocks, let's call these proxies you check, and forms an instrument, which is the size weighted average of idiosyncratic shocks. And once you, once you are given those, you can estimate one over zeta simply through OLS by regressing price changes on, on US or little z. Okay, and the idea here is really it's very similar to the index inclusion literature, um, where people have, have sort of like used shocks to index funds um, and see how that impacts prices. We're sort of using ideas of theoretic demand shocks to all investors, and in particular, the, in particular, the large ones. Five. Okay, five minutes. Okay, good. So let me show you, uh, let me show you some numbers. So what you see over here is the multiplier estimates in column one and column two. Now, in order to isolate those idiosyncratic shocks, we're estimating factor models. And so the first column over here has essentially two factors, one factor on which all funds load equally. The second one is a factor on which funds can load, uh, can have different loadings. That gives you a multiplier estimate of seven. If you add another principal component, you get a multiplier estimate of five. You can also estimate elasticities and you find something like, like 0 .0 0 0.15, uh, 0 0.2. If you look at the elasticity of the corporate sector, then we find it to be quite low. So within a quarter, the corporate sector is not particularly elastic. But of course, over longer horizons, that may be, that may be different. We confirm these numbers using like 13F data where we find multiplier estimates between three and three and six. Now, if you look at longer horizon, we don't see that these price effect mean revert. Um, now, of course, if you go to longer horizons, then confidence intervals widen. And so that makes it more challenging to make sort of like, like firm statements. Um, but at least there's no evidence of mean reversion, which is consistent with our theory. If you get a permanent like inflow or, or a very persistent inflow, prices are permanently going to stay, stay higher. Um, we can use this model uh, and the decomposition once we have it in place to see how important different sectors are for movements in prices. So literally every quarter we can ask how important each and every investor sector is uh, to move prices. And so for the aggregate stock market, we find that half of the variation is driven by households. Another 25% uh, uh, driven by mutual funds. So that's sort of uh, very, uh, very much related to like Winston's paper, uh, sort of emphasizing this important role for, for mutual funds for asset prices. And you can sort of go down, go down the list. <clears throat> we then ask, because the, the shocks that we now isolate are a combination of actual flows and demand shocks, like how important are truly capital flows. And so we can do this using micro data for a subset of, of all the investors. And for mutual funds, we find that 80% of the variation is driven purely by capital flows. It is 90% for ETFs. And for state and local pension plans, which, which obviously have very stable flows, um, they have like around 35 to 40% of their variation in, in overall demand <clears throat> shocks is driven by, by capital flows. Now we conclude by, by trying to measure the aggregate inflow into the market using the flow of funds. And here we need to make some additional measurement, measurement assumptions. And, but what, what we find is that, um, that the total flow is highly correlated, the sort of inflow to the market is correlated with, um, uh, with equity prices. Here you see the cyclical component in prices and flows as measured by, uh, where the cyclical component is measured using, using Hamilton's filter. Lastly, what we do is we, we um, connect our new measure of flows <clears throat> to other drivers of prices that people have looked at, such as uh, <coughs> sorry, measures of beliefs and uh, measures of GDP growth. Um, and so what you find is that flows, capital flows into the market um, and measures of expectations are actually highly correlated. And so that extends the evidence of Greenwood and Slifer um, to a broader set of investors. If you put both of them together and try to explain prices, what you find is that, that both survey expectations of returns and aggregate capital flows into the market uh, are significant in driving uh, return variation. And the two combined explain around like uh, around 6% of variation in returns also controlling for, for macroeconomic fundamentals. And so that means that we're sort of hopefully making some progress in trying to understand 
what are the drivers of, of, of stock market fluctuations. So what's also in the paper um, is, is a connection between the micro and macro elasticities. Um, there's a GE model that, that we're in the process of, of, of calibrating. We explore more of the policy, policy implications and think about questions when, for instance, there's like inertia and demand and how that plays out in, in, in the dynamic model. Um, so to conclude, sort of like, like we're sort of exploring the idea that markets are, are inelastic, which, which contrasts sort of the, the traditional uh, models, both rational and, and behavioral. Um, and, and sort of like the implications are that, that if this hypothesis is, is true, and again, let me sort of like reemphasize what I said at the beginning is that, that I think we need a lot of work to try to, sort of, I don't know, additional work and methods and data and, 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 uh, and other instruments potentially to try to estimate this. But the upside of this is that we can sort of make macro finance way more tangible. So, so we can trace back fluctuations in the market to, uh, to actual flows, try to understand why, where these flows may come from, like where demands of different investors come from. Um, and we can really can get to the sources of, 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 of market, market fluctuations. Okay, and of course, once, once we live in this world, then, then, then some of these questions like QE for equities, uh, or, or what are the corporate finance implications by thinking about firms as arbitrage, or suddenly those questions become relevant that weren't as relevant as well. Um, so that's it. Uh, let me stop here and um, uh, thanks a lot for Yvonne, to Yvonne for discussing the paper. Thank you very much, Ralph. And you already introduced your discussion, so we're looking forward to Yvonne Shaul Yastovich's discussion. Great to see you back in a way here, Yvonne. And the floor is yours. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm uh, delighted to uh, discuss this very exciting paper. So um, the main question is uh, kind of very fundamental for the finance. It's what drives asset prices? And uh, many of us in the audience have written models kind of using more conventional factors, cash flow risk, uh, uncertainty, other fluctuations. And typically those models, especially in GE settings, do not feature any particular role for like uh, objects like flows, flows within or across asset classes. Again, the simplest example, we have single agent, single firm model. We can't even talk about flows um, in this type of specification. And what the authors want to do here is kind of provide a framework, empirical and um, kind of theoretical, to help us think about the importance of those flows. And this is dubbed as the uh, inelastic markets hypothesis. So basically asset demand is not very sensitive to price changes. And then equilibrium prices have to adjust a lot if you have those kind of flow, uh, flow demand disturbances. Now I have to say it's a very rich paper with lots of different takes, refinements, extensions, and to formulate, quantify this hypothesis. I will not do justice to all of the margins here. I'll just basically focus on the very kind of basic model just to help me kind of understand and unpack what's going on here. So again, this is like the simplest specification that the authors entertain. We have a fund uh, which faces a mandate and the leverage constraint. So here, P is price of equity, Q is quantity of equity, theta would be the leverage ratio. Again, theta is fixed. Authors have other extensions to have it move with premium. Let me ignore that for now. And W is the wealth. And wealth has, again, P times Q, that's my market value of equity, and B is the bonds. And that's as simple as that. Now, I want to figure out, well, what's the concept of the demand function? Can I use this equation? Again, I have P, I have Q. Well, not quite because W is endogenous. And here the idea is that fund already sits on some equity. So if its price goes up, then the wealth is going to go up. And we also can entertain the idea that those Bs, right, that cash or bonds, they may also change with respect to those um, price changes. Again, think about the flow effects. Okay, so how can we capture that? And basically the point, the main point in the paper is that, well, let's just took a partial derivative of wealth. And you can capture those wealth effects by taking a partial derivative of wealth with respect to prices. Um, again, I'm getting a bit nerdy here, but it's kind of important. I'm gonna make sure I kind of understand what the authors are doing here. Uh, note that here, and that I'll come back to this later, like we don't internalize the effect of price and quantity. Again, it's a partial derivative. Other than that, we are kind of, it, it's very simple. We take our leverage constraint, just take partial derivatives, left-hand side, right-hand side, stick in this uh, W derivative from the first line, rearrange slightly, replace deltas, Ds by deltas, and pretty much derive the main equation in the paper. Again, this is kind of what the authors are 
putting out there. This is what the author going to be testing implicitly in the data. So let me kind of free write it here and kind of think about that. Again, we have this uh, quantity equity change in equity quantities. This is linked to the equity price change and this idea of flows of changing the value of the bond. Now, just to kind of get our minds uh, around this, uh, to get put some numbers here, think about theta being 80%, again, plug in the number there. Here you see again this interpretation, the demand is very inelastic. If prices change, quantities barely move. Now impose equilibrium, basically put it equal to zero, supply is fixed, supply is equal to one, and you'll get the second result in the paper that prices are very sensitive to flows. And here we have this multiplication of five. So I was saying before, the rest of the work kind of basically kind of works around this equation to quantify this extended and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm gonna provide some comments here, maybe some of my, a bit of confusion here. So let's go back to this equation, right? So how do I interpret that, right? Again, this is a demand schedule. So can I say that, okay, I'm a, I'm a hedge fund manager. I'm gonna say, okay, the, I'm gonna think about possible pairs of price and the, inflow changes. Again, can price go up by 1% or 0% go down, can have some inflows, and would that be my response of my, of my equities? Can I think about this way? So here I'm a little bit uh, confused because there's one thing kind of which trips me here, because this change in demand is generally would be inconsistent with the fund's mandate. But what I mean here, again, we start with PQ equal to theta W. Now the question is, after this change in equity, would my leverage ratio we still be the same? And given the change in equity demand, given the price, given the B, would I still maintain the same leverage? Actually, the answer would be not quite. Not, un not unless we have an equilibrium. Now, mathematically, what happens here, going back to the equation, is that managers don't internalize changes in the wealth and leverage due to, to equity purchases. Let me give you an example of this again. So again, an equilibrium, everything is perfectly nice. You can show analytically that if quantity of equity does not change, then the fund's leverage ratio would stay the same at theta. But again, think about some other changes. Suppose, let me say, the, the inflows are close to zero, and let's say price would change by 1% for some other reasons. In that case, it's easy to see that the equity demand, let's say, would go down by 0.2% based on this equation. Now, equity price goes up by 1%, in that case, the value of equity will change by 0.8%, even though the value of bonds have not changed. In this example, my leverage ratio would have to change. So the fund does not satisfy the, the mandate anymore. And I guess to me, the question is again, I think it comes down to this issue. When mm -hmm. we derive this demand, should the fund internalize its leverage constraint? The idea is that if I buy equity, it would change my wealth, it would change my leverage ratio. And again, are there any assumptions here that maybe managers are not sophisticated enough, they don't, they don't think through that? Now, a possible answer here is that, well, but in the maybe it's equilibrium should be such that all the constraints hold. That's exactly what's happening here in the model. Again, supply is fixed, leverage constraints do hold. I'm still a bit again, unsure here, again, why would managers give me some answers for their demand, which would be off their mandate in the future. So why exactly are they unsophisticated? Why exactly are they, what exactly are they thinking about? I guess a more a different take on that is, well, what's about when supply is not fixed? Suppose we go to the example of multiple funds, right? In that case, the supply can be fixed on aggregate, but I don't think that for each fund, the supply has to be, has to remain fixed. And in that case, would the fund's equity choices be off its leverage constraint? Now, why am I kind of uh, hammering this point? It's actually pretty easy to uh, make engines, uh, make investors internalize this constraint, but that does change quite a bit the, some of the implications of the model, not all of them. So what do I mean here? Well, it's very easy. Again, I know that wealth says PQ times PQ plus B. I can put this from the start, rearrange, every, rearrange everything, and now I can kind of compute my derivatives, taking into account that when I change Q, the wealth will also change. But I will get what looks something very, very similar to what the authors have, but with one big difference. 
And basically here, this one minus theta moves from the elasticity to kind of do kind of the ratio here. So what does so what does not change? The thing which does not change is the equilibrium price flow relationship. So I still have identical results to the paper that uh, um, if quantity does not change, my price is very responsive to the flows with the same coefficient. But as you can see from here, what, what changes a lot is elasticity of demand. From here, it's not one minus set, it's gonna be one. Again, which kind of makes sense. Again, it can think, makes sense. Think about, again, if bonds don't, there's no change into, there's no inflow here. If price goes up by 1%, my quantity would have to go down by 1% to keep the leverage the same. That's kind of almost like mechanically what, what is happening here. That kind of again brings my, that my, my question. And uh, um, basically, is there are two statements here, right? One is about the equilibrium price response to the flow. And the other one is about elasticity of demand with respect to prices. Um, in the paper, they are kind of uh, almost equivalent in the sense that, I mean, that's, we kind of, they kind of derive this strong price response as a function of this, of following the inelastic demand hypothesis. I guess a bigger question is, does it have to be the case? Taken at the face value, my results would suggest I'll get the same response of equilibrium prices to flows, basically in this, and these two assumptions, the demand is inelastic, but managers do not internalize leverage constraint or demand is elastic and managers do internalize that. So again, the bigger question here is, is this elasticity of demand, is it a necessary condition for this price response? So there's, there's a lot of some other assumptions. Now, maybe it's an empirical question. Maybe there are some deeper reasons. Again, the, I almost kind of have to think about my micro 101, right? So what is a demand function? What's the right way to, derive that in either other deeper reasons to prefer one over the other. And and that, then it's, that helped me unpack those assumptions and the derivations. Now one, uh, so my second point is, uh, um, and I'm still kind of at the level of this very basic model, uh, going back to the bond demand elasticity, right? So let me rephrase or refocus uh, the author's and a key idea based in question, right? So if a fund buys 1 billion of US equity, it sells bond to finance their position, how much does the value of bonds change? Now for the office, it's about the value of equity. That's kind of what motivates this paper. In my case, well, why are we missing out bonds? Why, why what's so special about equity relative to bonds that we're thinking about elasticity of demand for equity, but not for bonds? Now in that simple model, I mean, this is basically by assumption. Bonds gonna be very elastic. Uh, bond prices do not change at all. And risk-free rates are fixed and shares of bonds just flow from one fund to another. That's fine for the simple example. Again, what's the deeper economics behind this? Why is it the case? Is it because bond markets are larger, they're more liquid, they're deeper? Are there different types of investors there? I guess the conceptual question is, if I'm thinking about this equity markets as being very, inelastic. Does it mean that there is some residual market out there, bonds or something else, which have to be very elastic? Or maybe it's just like a detail, which is not important. I'm not sure. But quantitatively is important. Again, there is a big literature on the co-movements on bond and stock prices. Again, Ralph knows this literature very well. Again, can they say something about that? I mean, maybe more recently, again, it's uh, the COVID times, all these examples of dash for cash, when we've seen a big outflows from both bonds and equities, and the both prices drop at the same time. Again, is it something driven by the flows or by other macro factors? You know, Ralph was saying, again, they have this work in progress GE model, and hopefully it can help me sort out some of those issues. Again, why, why equity, why not bonds? And what is the deeper economics for elasticity of equity versus the bond market? I have a couple of more minutes left. I have basically one more point to make. I was kind of thinking, well, how, what, what, what else this evidence is related to in the literature out there? I think one of the uh, possible subfields here, which I think thinks about similar issues and actually make somewhat related points, see this literature on changes in sectoral shares. Uh, that goes back to in, in variance frontiers, in variance world, right? So in that world, can think about just a simple mean variance demand. 
we would know that the asset shares would increase at times of high risk premia, right, at times of high expected returns. Again, that's also true in the Z world, as done as shown by, by, by work by John Campbell and others. And if I just think about that, well, expected returns and realized returns uh, have negative correlation. So again, if anything, I would expect the equity share to decline when stock prices, uh, stock prices are high. Again, I know it's not the same as uh, quantity of shares. One kind of has to kind of un, un, undo all of that. But again, in this case, like I wouldn't expect, let's say, the equity shares to go up, for example, quite a bit following a demand for bonds. I think there is more to that because there's also some recent work which actually showed this, uh, the simple logic actually fails empirically to describe behavior of changes in the asset shares. And there they look at uh, basically stock versus bonds versus housing. They also look at the kind of um, holdings within the stocks. Uh, so one thing they find is that, for example, that the wealth shares do not correlate with asset risk premium. But more relevant here, they actually really uh, try to hold down this, hold this idea that it's really hard for us to explain these movements across sectors over time using standard conventional factors. Again, using like the simple logic of mean variance or whatnot, trying to relate those changes to the risk premium or other factors, it just doesn't go very well in the data and we need something else. Again, they call those hedging demands or maybe some other demands. And this is what primarily drives, I mean, not not that it gets flows, more like changes in the allocations over time. At some surface level, that sounds kind of similar to a big picture message of this paper, that we cannot capture, you know, changes in allocations by conventional factors. I guess the question again is, is it, are there some deeper relations between those papers empirically? Uh, they also provide them kind of a GE model to think about that. Again, the, the question is, what are the differences between the approaches? Let me conclude here. I guess I said it's an exciting paper. It uh, provides an agenda for lots of future work. It's a very rich model. There's a lot of applications and implications. I was basically thinking just about the very basic specification and kind of how can I unpack some of these uh, perhaps assumptions or in deriving those demands and deriving those, uh, and deriving those formulations. And my last point was about this broader literature on movement in the asset shares. Let me stop here and leave more time for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan. I, I think uh, given the, the rich content of both the presentation and the discussion, we should probably uh, nevertheless uh, start ask, uh, by asking the audience if there are any questions or comments, and then probably Ralph can, can uh, reply to, to Ivan's comments afterwards. Uh, so any questions from the audience? Uh, hi, Krishna. Hi, Ralph. Is Winston? Hey, Winston. Yeah. Hey. Uh, hey, Ralph. Uh, it's very insightful and exciting paper. Yeah. So, and uh, thank, I think it's uh, your, your findings help us to help justify our paper. So, we're definitely excited. Well, we are still published the paper. Yeah. So, I have two questions to, to clarify. Why is we, I think it's quite interesting to quantify and find that this, uh, this flows actually. Can, can account for a big chunk of fluctuation of, of the uh, asset pricing fluctuations. But the flows, so, so when, when you say this in your mind, because we know the flows also endogenously respond to the fundamental fluctuations. So here, when you say this, do you enter focus on this non-fundamental component of the flows or you know, both fundamental, you know, driven by fundamental and non-fundamental reasons? My second question is, I, I feel it's quite exciting. It's like, since I was a student, I've been working on this paper with Leonid and I created a dark matter paper. We call it, so I, I feel it's very exciting on that part because here you kind of like, you have this flows, rich data flows and you can have the identification on the elasticities. So, so the, the, the fundamental, you know, in, in our paper we show the fundamental issue of dark matter is First is the refutability of the model. Second is all other sample performance of the model. Yeah, but these two are like intrinsically connected. I can see when, when you go to this rich data of flows and uh, identify carefully adding more data and moments to, to identify this elasticity, price elasticity of, of flows, 
it can help us to mitigate the concern of the refutability a lot relative to like long risk models, time variant disaster risk model. That's very convincing. But, uh, but I, I, I'm thinking, how about auto, auto sample performance? I, I think if you can, maybe in a separate paper or some other like younger researchers, maybe uh, I will take your model where I've worked with my students. So, so it's like auto sample performance of, of your model relative to uh, long risk models, time variant disaster risk models, heavy models. If we show all auto sum performance is significantly better, that's very convincing. You really replace, so mitigate this dark matter concerns in asset pricing. Yeah, so that's, that's two. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, these are great questions and thank you, Han, for like a really great discussion. So I think both of you guys are getting sort of to the key issues sort of like um, in terms of like new questions that, that is raised. So one is um, sort of like what drives flows. And so um, flows can respond to can respond to prices and it would sort of like, like if you think about a typical empirical fact that flows like respond positively to to uh, to, to contemporaneous price changes and, and, and lag ones, then that actually makes the market more inelastic because you get positive feedback trading and, and, and demand curve, the effective demand curve is cheaper. Um, and so, so sort of like, like estimating that elasticity uh, would also be, be interesting. And so one of the big sort of themes that we're trying to get after now is like, what are the primitive sort of like like impulses that sort of like shock the system? So part of what the paper does now is to sort of say those shocks hit like a very inelastic market. And the second question is like, what are the primary in impulses that sort of like um, um, generate those fluctuations? And part of that is sort of like, okay, like you get some extra amplification from like positive feedback trading, but then there's still additional primitive shocks and what are those? And that's what we're trying to get at next. And I think those two combined is sort of like really what we're ultimately want to have in terms of out of sample, um, Predictability, I can offer you one thing at this point. Of course, I, I agree with uh, everything you say in terms of like um, trying to sort of like reduce the dark matter somehow. Um, so here, here's one thing we do that in the GIV setting to get you sort of like an out of sample estimate if you wish. So, so with GIV sort of like remember that what you're doing is you're computing a size weighted aggregate of idiosyncratic sums. Now in 13F data, you have lots of, you have lots of funds. And so what we do is we rank them based on their size. And we, we build one instrument based on the even ones. So we take like two, four, six, eight. The other one we do based on the odd ones, like one, three, five, seven. And so now you have two instruments and we estimate sort of the elasticity using both I don't know, separate sort of instruments to get very similar estimates. And interestingly, sort of the two instruments are also like, like effectively uncorrelated, which again is sort of like, and it gives us some comfort that we're not missing some key, key factors. Um, now, other examples would be like, it would be really interesting to sort of look at, of course, is to say, okay, suppose, um, and I'm looking at Emmanuel here, like suppose the ECB decides to do like QE for equities, uh, what would the model predict? And what, I don't know, it's clear what the model predicts, but what, what do we see in, what do we see in markets? And so one interesting sort of observation here is that Hong Kong sort of announced the QE program for equities. They purchased like uh, 6% of the market and markets jumped up by 24%. So that gives you a multiplier of four. Of course, there's lots of other things that may be going on at the time, but it gives you like one other kind of hint of evidence that these order of magnitudes are not sort of like uh, out, of, out of line. Yeah. Well, further questions, comments? Senor Palacios, go ahead. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I'm sorry if this question, uh, I, I arrived late and I have not seen the paper, so apologize, Exante, if it's incredibly stupid. What is the time decay of this effect? Or, or I didn't see in, in, in what was discussed, you know, I mean, we, we should think that there's a jump or, or if, you know, something happens to prices and then they decay. Do so, so we have anything to know how fast they decay? Yeah, so what we do is, so in our model, actually, it depends, it, it all depends on how persistent flows are. And so, so if you get a, 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 an inflow uh, that is permanent, so suppose a Norwegian sovereign wealth fund decides to move 60, 40, 70, 30, and that's kind of a very long lasting shock, then we expect this price, price to jump up and to actually stay there and expect the returns up here, but appear a little bit lower. And so, the, so in that case, um, it, it's all gonna, but of course if flows are mean reverting, then you expect to see this sort of typical, typical price pattern. And so markets are forward looking. In fact, they're slightly myopic, but, but they're forward looking, anticipate future flows. And so mean reverting flows are gonna have a different impact than like long uh, persistent flows. The flow shocks that we identify based on these idiosyncratic shocks, at least if we look across different horizons, they do not tend to mean revert. So you see prices like, I don't know, they're flat, they jump up, and then they stay there. But of course, if we go to longer horizons, confidence intervals widen. So 
um, we can't rule out that they mean over it either, but like at least the point estimates are, are, are flat. There's no strong evidence of, of mean over it. Now, for the aggregate stock market, that's also something you would expect because if there would be very strong mean reversion, there would be very strong negative autocorrelation in market returns, which we know is not something that we see, at least not at a quarterly frequency. And so that sort of like gives you a way, hopefully, of thinking about, thinking about that. I had a question or two, uh, if we still have time. So of course. W one, so in your simplest model, you didn't talk about uh, expectations at all. Um, so what's the expectation formation process exactly? Um, uh, uh, you just said something about myopic, but I missed that in the talk. Maybe I was, uh, um, I was not paying attention as closely as I should have. Uh, that's one question. The second question, how can I think about preferred habitat type of uh, uh, considerations in, in, your, in your world? I mean, we know that there, I mean, I think there's pretty strong evidence that this exists for regulatory reasons or other, other reasons. And so how do I think about uh, sort of these elasticities in a, in a somewhat richer model where basically different types of investors have different habitats uh, they prefer? Okay, right. so it's a, it's a great question. So, um, um, so the first one in terms of like expectations. So we start with like flows that come from I don't know, kind of nowhere. So it's like an exogenous shocks, and those flows, I mean, they could tell you something about future fundamentals. They may not tell you something about future fundamentals. And so, um, the one thing that we like, and then in the, sort of the dynamic model, there's also additional demand shocks. And again, you can sort of imagine that those demand shocks um, are expectations of future fundamentals, or they may be preference shocks. And so one thing that is interesting sort of like going forward is that we can isolate those, those demand shocks like flows and, and pure demand shocks. And we can actually ask the question, to what extent do they tell us something about future fundamentals? And if they don't tell us anything about future fundamentals, but they are moving prices, that sort of like gives you an explanation as to why risk premium move around. And so instead of saying like, okay, risk premium move around like full stop, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to say, and, and so we're working on that, so to think about, okay, the movement in, 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 in asset prices is driven, at, let's say half by households, but their flows are, are I don't, know, don't forecast future fundamentals, so they are the main driver of expected returns. But you have, let's say, uh, hedge funds, their flows and their demand structures are actually very predictive of future, of future fundamentals, but they don't tell you anything about, or, but they, and as a result, they don't contribute uh, to risk premium variation. So, so it's sort of like you can always use them for one or the other, either for to tell you something about future fundamentals or now then of course, then we have the connection to like survey expectations of return. So there you sort of see that the measure of flows we have does correlate strongly with that. But of course, the question is where do those expectations come from? Too? So we're still and getting to the, try to get closer to the primitive, primitive shock. Now about preferred habitat, that's, that's um, in a way sort of like, like preferred habitat, what it's going to do is going to give you inelastic demand, right? So it's going to give you a component of demand that, Kind of regardless of the price, I prefer 10-year bonds. And in the same way, what we're saying is that, that of course, that also happens in the equity space or in the asset allocation space. So kind of regardless of stock prices, our strategic allocation is like 70-30. You may sort of like, like move a little bit on the margin that you think that tech stocks are maybe a little expensive or what have you. But so the strategic allocation, which we, I know, many of us have worked on, all we're saying is like, like, like lots of funds actually do that and behave like that. Um, and in, in equilibrium, that like sort of leads to a very inelastic, very inelastic market. Now, that doesn't mean that when these institutions with their preferred habitat with regulation, when they weren't there, that the market was very elastic. Because of course, before you were dealing with like lots of households who were owning these equities, and we know that those are very inert as well. And so maybe if anything, they made the market a little bit more elastic, but still very inelastic. So that's sort of, the basic point is that you just go institution by institution and there's very few of them that, that have these very flexible mandates uh, and that sort of leads to, to the basic idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think we can just take a couple of minutes off before uh, the final presentation of the day starts. I would like to, to thank uh, Ralph and Ivan for uh, uh, stimulating presentation and discussion and I'm looking forward to to the final paper of the day, but as I said, let's take a few minutes off and I'll see you back at, at uh, six my time and whatever that is at uh, your time zone.